Welcome to Baseball Seasons 2003, a wild ride. At the beginning of every baseball season, we know two things. One, hope springs eternal, even for the most star-crossed of franchises. This is the year. The Red Sox all the way. Number one. This is the year. Go Cubbies! And two, with change comes opportunity. I think it's going to be a fun season for myself. It's nice, man. It's different. And I think a fun season, I think overall for the whole team. You were Lisa right there? You're going to be right where you want it. Each new season also brings a new set of goals. From defending champions aiming to repeat. The Anaheim Angels are the champions of baseball! To familiar championship contenders looking to rebound from disappointment. My first year I told Mr. Steinberg, I thought I had a lot of high expectations. <laughs> I mean, if we don't get to the World Series and win, it's an off year for us. And that's the price you pay when you play for the Yankees. And after Clemens, Pettit, Messina, Wells, and Weaver failed to get the Yankees to the Fall Classic in 2002, the team set its sights on the Caribbean. And Cuban Jose Contreras, the offseason prize of 03. But they'd have to battle their arch rivals. We all know that George Steinbrenner, uh, when there's a premium free agent out there that everybody wants, George makes up his mind that he's going to get this guy. He's one of the best international pitchers of all time. He was going to be the guy that tipped the scales in the American League East. There was a lot of competition between the two teams. The 2002 season was the fifth consecutive year in which the Red Sox had finished behind the Yankees, which was then a major league record. To combat the disappointment of the past, the Red Sox turned to the future, hiring the youngest general manager in baseball history, 28-year-old Theo Epstein. Skeptical about my age, so you think I'm too old for the job? <laughs> um, well, I think there's a difference between youthfulness and inexperience. But youth rarely trumps tradition. And like so many other Yankee Red Sox battles, the Yanks once again came out on top when they signed Contreras. Was that signing sweeter because you beat out the Red Sox? It's a fringe benefit. Theo Epstein was rumored to be so furious that he picked up a chair and threw it against the wall uh, the minute that he heard that the Yankees had won the bidding. The evil empire yeah. strikes once again. While the Yankees' big spending made them favorites again in 2003, Major League Baseball's new collective bargaining agreement promised smaller market teams a piece of the pie as well. What was born out of the labor talks in 2002 was the Robinet theory of taking from the rich and giving to the poor with the idea of trying to enhance competitive balance. The Yankees are just going to beat everybody up, dude. I'm sharing a goodly amount of that money every year with them so that everybody can have some. But while the game's economic policies aim to help David compete with Goliath, uh -oh. some felt the key to parity could be had for much less it could be found in any local bookstore. Uh, Moneyball really took baseball by storm that year. And everybody was debating the methodology. The book focused on A's GM Billy Bean and his unconventional approaches to building winners in Oakland by focusing on different statistics. They were going to the undervalued statistics and saying, OK, what wins baseball games? You know, and that's really where on-base percentage really started taking off. You know. Get the guys who don't make outs. Ah, hey, ah. Not ready for that one, Jimmy. Owners were reading that book and asking their general managers why they couldn't do it. And that's when you started seeing thinking GMs go deeper into uh, baseball statistics more than just batting average home runs and RBIs. Doesn't matter about how much money you're getting paid, it's whether or not you can play the game. And as the games began in 2003, an early injury appeared to shift the balance of power. Derek Jeter's dislocated shoulder would put him out for six weeks. But yet another international import to the Bronx quickly picked up the slack. Well, they didn't call him Godzilla in Japan for nothing. Bounce hit deep to right field. Going back to Dyer, looking up. See ya! A grand slam for Hideki Matsui! He's 
a tough cookie. I mean, he, he's a blue-collar guy that the players really took a shine to. What an introduction to Yankee Stadium! And while Matsui's home opener heroics were a revelation, think he has a player for the dramatic? Baseball's biggest early surprise was in the AL Central. You know, the way the Royals started the 2003 season was something that was completely unexpected. Holy smokes! Carlos Beltran scorches this pitch. There's no one who could have seen that coming. Kansas City now 9-0 for the first time in club history. In that first month of the season, they were the story of baseball. As the 2003 season came into focus, it became clear the Angels would not repeat. Our team wasn't built much differently from the team that won in 02. But Oakland, they were the jewel of our division. I think it showed up during the season. As Moneyball sat atop the bestseller lists in the spring of 2003, the A's under new manager Ken Maka continued to prove they were baseball's quintessential small market success story. Going into the year, I mean, obviously we had made the playoffs three straight years. We knew we had a great team. We had the, the big three there. The big three, Mark Mulder, Barry Zito, and... Tim Hudson, a two-hit complete game flanking. Who combined for 45 wins in the 2003 season and a 3.03 ERA. A-Rod up on top of it. What, what's Oakland all about is three things. Hudson, Mulder, and Zito. Big curveball. And while those three guys are there, they can pick any philosophy they want. They're going to be very, very competitive. With the big three on the mound and an offense powered by Eric Chavez and Miguel Tejada. Son, you need some love, dog. Yeah. The A's got hot early in 03. Oakland A's at 22 and 13 are off to their best start since 1990. Meanwhile, in the AL Central, the Royals followed their 16 and 7 April with a 10 and 19 May. What? dropping them into second place behind another small market success story, the defending division champs. You know, that team, it was definitely special. Get on over that little man. We played like we are just having fun and we were just, we were just that close. Don't sit on that his lap. Come on, man. Come on. Rarely is chemistry alone an explanation for a team's success. That pitch was nasty right there. That's a Nintendo curveball. But the Twins found ways to win, despite not having any player ranked in the top 10 in homers, runs batted in, or ERA. This guy can hit. A home run for Ben Kavich. We feel for the first time in a long time in this organization, the World Series is a legitimate chance for us. Game over. Twins win. Nine in a row for Minnesota. By the end of May, Minnesota was on fire. But by then, the eyes of the baseball world had turned east to the premier rivalry in all of sports, where two titans of the game were sitting on embers on the brink of eruption. Having already been trumped by the Yankees and the Jose Contreras sweepstakes, the 2003 Red Sox needed to seek other ways to improve their team. The Red Sox were trying to find some salary bargains that they could work into the lineup. They made some convoluted deal with Kevin Millar, who had already committed to play in Japan. Bill Miller came in. And Ortiz was simply one of those inexpensive stopgap players who might have some upside. I think even they will tell you they didn't realize how good Ortiz could be. Swung on and there's a drive! Now the Red Sox look like geniuses. Home run, David Ortiz! We brought him in in 2003 and he really exceeded our expectations. David Ortiz has done it again! He was as dangerous a hitter as there was in all of baseball. Ortiz joined Manny Ramirez and Nomar Garcia Parra to form a fearsome middle of the order in Boston. Here we go, play some baseball! And as the Sox on-field successes mounted, so too did their confidence. This isn't 1986 team. You've got to be going with the Sox. <laughs> this is the 2003 Sox. This is the Sox team, 2003. We had our own personality. A personality that could be summarized in a single phrase. 
Well, I had said, listen, somebody needs to step up and cowboy up in this locker room and, and appreciate this team, because you're not going to see a team come around like this too often. Hey, we're a close-knit team now, guys. And well, all of a sudden, this cowboy up thing takes off. And then the city adopted this cowboy up with this 2003 socks. And then the shirts started being made, and then the hats. And I think that's what we believed, that this was going to be the year. Belief was one thing, but after ace Pedro Martinez, the Sox were no match for New York's arsenal of arms. Struck him out swinging. Number 4,000. In the Bronx, the Rocket had history in his sights. Grounded to first. This will do it. Roger Clemens has joined an exclusive club. He wins his 300th game. With Clemens 300th out of the way and a healthy Derek Jeter back patrolling shortstop, New York hit the midseason marker in full stride. Ball game over. Yankees win. But the Red Sox were just two games back and sought to chase the Yankees for the entire season. In 2003, the American League's premier franchise was unmistakable. The New York Yankees, for the fifth straight year, are the American League East champions. But the class of the National League had been dominating regular season play even longer. Now the Braves are right at home in October. They've qualified for the playoffs every season since 91. We've always kind of built our club on pitching. Your starting rotation. They are the mill ticket. And for a decade, the Braves had an unstoppable trio. Got it. In Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz. They made the Braves who they were for so long. The Braves starters are all interchangeable in that they could all be number one starters on any given day. Facing those guys back to back to back, it was no weak spot. But Smoltz had moved to the bullpen late in 01 to protect a fragile arm. Smoltz with a 1 2 pitch. Strike three called, and the ball game was over. And prior to 03, another vaunted member of the Braves rotation signed with a divisional rival. When Tom Glavin left here, it was like, oh my goodness, there goes a the franchise. It looked like things were just going to be destroyed that moment as far as the great Atlanta Braves run. But acquisitions of Russ Ortiz and Mike Hampton provided new reinforcements on the mound. And led by Gary Sheffield, Atlanta put together a staggering lineup that flipped the script to redefine Braves' dominance. This one's gone. Another Gary Sheffield homer. And with veterans Chipper Jones, Andrew Jones, and Javi Lopez also putting together big years, the Braves cruised once again in 03. And the Braves have wrapped up their division title. Out west, the Giants not only had to rebound from October heartbreak, but also do so with a new manager and several new players. There was high expectation, even though we turned the roster over to the point where we had some new people that were going to contribute. The newcomers included infielders Edgardo Alfonso and Ray Durham, who would support reigning MVP Barry Bonds in the San Francisco lineup. Wave it, bye-bye Barry Bonds. It wasn't just Barry Bonds. They just had a lot of surrounding parts that made that team really good and great pitching staff with Jason Smith leading the way. The Giants would win 100 games in 2003 and own first place the entire season. Dusty Baker had left San Francisco after 2002 for a new challenge, managing the Cubs, led by another feared slugger in Sammy Sosa. He's Sammy's team, he's the man. And I just came from a similar situation where Barry's the man. But Baker had something else to work with, a pair of pitchers as talented as any in the game. Kerry Wood continues to throw laser beams. You know, Kerry is a guy that was knocking on the door of high success. Uh, Pryor was a young pitcher that came with a lot of collegiate accolades and uh, had real, real, real good stuff. He got it, 16 strikeouts. What, what a performance for Mark Pryor today. The Cardinals were also in the NL Central hunt, thanks to perhaps the best young player in the game, super slugger Albert Pujols. look for with a great hitter like Albert is look for protection in front and behind and we had a right hand hitter in Scott Rowling we had a left hand hitter in Jim Edmonds they got some thunder in this lineup and you just couldn't avoid any of them and they all complemented each other the Astros had their own collection of strong bats in Houston Berkman looking to do a little more damage and he has in Jeff Bagwell Craig Biggio Lance Berkman 
and the newly acquired Jeff Kent. And there is more magic, and it comes from Jeff Kent. And the magic continued one night in June at Yankee Stadium after Astros ace Roy Oswald left after one hitless inning with an injury. Will the Yankees be no hit by a group of Astro pitchers? Jimmy Williams, the manager, said with all the pitchers I'm using, it can't be a no-hitter going on here. It's a no-no at New York for six Houston pitchers. It was the first time it ever happened, and it won't happen again. As the Cubs, Cards, and Astros jostle for position in the Central, several other upstart teams set their eyes on the wild card. World Series champ, 2003 Expos. The Expos were in a unique position, owned by Major League Baseball and playing a quarter of their home games in Puerto Rico. The Expos will win. They're now 29 and 17. Best start in their history. Led by Hall of Famer Frank Robinson, the club kept an unlikely postseason berth in its sights all summer long. Miami, Florida, a city of contrasts, a late in life retreat for retirees, a trendy stomping ground for the young and restless. In the summer of 2003, Miami's baseball team, the Florida Marlins, reflected the city's two-pronged population. New Marlins skipper, 72-year-old Jack McKeon. I feel like I'm a seasoned citizen in both years and baseball experience. How many kids do you have? I got four kids, but nine grandkids. Jeez. Here was this grandfatherly guy around this coterie of young, spirited, talented ball players that by and large were still trying to find its way. But when McKeon took over the Marlins in May, the fish were floundering. Jack McKeon's been asked to try to get this club back on the winning track. But I'm not a miracle worker. We got a lot of work to do, and hopefully we can take this club to another level. The club did have talent with a roster that boasted solid pitching, reliable defense, and speed. Most notably at the top of the lineup where Juan Pierre and Luis Castillo sparked the offense. There's no secret to the Marlins offense. When the first two guys are getting on base, they make things happen. I'm really excited to be a team that's focused around speed. If I steal those bases, that's getting in scoring position for the team. And we do have a little power here also. Oh. That power came in the form of budding stars at the infield corners. Derek Lee and Mike Lowell. He is just locked in. You scared? Well, that's not fun to watch. It works. Behind the plate was a perennial all-star in Ivan Rodriguez, signed by the team to guide the talented but unproven pitching staff. It's nice to be part of the Marlins this year. Nice job, Pudge. I look forward to do a good thing for this team and see if this thing can uh, make the play out. All the pieces were in place, and as the Marlins heated up, they got a jolt of personality on the mound. We will witness the Major League debut of Dontrell Willis. Swing and a miss. Dontrell came on the scene. You know, the turn into the leg a little bit. He's got that funky, herky, jerky windup. He had some kind of great contortions. I mean, I, you know, I never seen anybody like it. I'm grass, Skip. I really do. I understand everything that you say. Dontrell Willis was a guy that looked as if he just enjoyed the game. It was pure. Joy. This guy's got character, he's got charisma. He's brought prime time back to South Florida. People enjoy watching me play. Dontrell Willis has taken this community by storm. I didn't do those things, you know, to be noticed. I just did those things because that's what I was comfortable with doing. The best breakthrough story in the major leagues this year. <laughs> and not only that, he could pitch a little bit too. It's a one hitter! A one hit shutout for Dontrell Willis. It's kind of made it a friendly competition between the starting pitchers. Put a little challenge to him by what he's done on the mound. Those guys, since he came, have really turned it on, and uh, they've been great. As the Marlins crept into the wild card race, the team was bolstered by another strong young arm, Josh Beckett, along with rookie hitting sensation Miguel Cabrera and Jeff Conine, a veteran who'd been on Florida's 1997 championship club. By summer's end, these fish found themselves among eight teams with legitimate hopes of a wild card berth. Wild baseball here in September. Maybe we should talk about who does not have a chance in the National League, because that would be quicker. The log jam continues in the National League wild card race. No! Yeah! 
Because I've never been a part of anything like this where this many different clubs have a chance to go somewhere in October. There's so many teams that are still in the hunt. You know, it's the hunt, the hunt for October. By September, the eight teams were all within three and a half games of each other. And they'd spend the season's final four weeks jockeying for position. Come on, boys. Come on, boys. And if that weren't enough, three of those teams were also playing for an NL Central title. And that's how it goes. You just reshuffle a deck every day. That's unbelievable. <laughs> it was crazy. But ultimately, it was us and the Phillies, and we ended up sweeping them at home, and uh, that was a deciding factor. And the Marlins have won the National League wild card. They were 10 games under in May. They're going to the playoffs. Baby, wow! In a year when Moneyball outlined a blueprint for building small market contenders, Florida, along with AL Central champion Minnesota and AL West winner Oakland, all captured playoff berths despite ranking among the bottom half of teams in payroll. What we saw right then is when it comes to baseball, it's not so much about money, it's about whether or not you can evaluate talent. Those teams showed you can win a lot of ball games with just talented players, even compete with the Yankees. Ball game over. Eastern Division and a race over. Yankees win. New York wrapped up its sixth straight division title with relative ease and along the way made a minor upgrade at third base in a deal with Cincinnati. Oh, and one other note today in sports, the Yankees got Aaron Boone. Oh, okay, great. A division title for the Yankees meant the Red Sox were once again second, but this defeat had a silver lining as the Sox captured the wild card and battled the Yanks hard during the season, convincing their fan base that this was a different kind of club. The Red Sox finally showed that they were capable foes. They were challengers, legitimate challengers to the Yankees. While the Sox entered the 2003 playoffs trying to exercise 84 years of ghosts, at Wrigley Field, the Cubs were aiming to vanquish nearly a century's worth. The excitement level is skyrocketing at Wrigley Field. Second base one. In Chicago and Boston, hopes were high heading into October. But as the playoffs would show, overcoming ancient demons can be a tricky business. The Cubs and Marlins emerged from heated playoff races in 2003 to face teams that had cruised into the postseason, with Chicago battling the Braves and Florida taking on the Giants. And the start of both series showed the pennant was anyone's for the taking. The crowd is ready. And here's the first pit. 11 strikeouts. Knocked in two runs. Slides out effort tonight by Wood. Chicago Cubs have won. Two-run double for DeRosa. 5-3 Atlanta. The Braves bounce back and beat the Cubs. In game one goes to Schmidt and the Giants. Well, here come the Marlins. Gone. Four of the Marlins are rolling here. So the Marlins come to Pac Bell Park and they get a split. I thought we should have won in our own ballpark and we didn't. And that'd be a huge advantage of being up 2-0 uh, and oh instead of being 1-1 one one going into Florida. But at Pro Player Stadium in Miami in game three, the Giants clawed their way to an extra inning lead and were just one out away from regaining home field advantage when Ivan Rodriguez stepped to the plate. Two outs, bases loaded, bottom of the 11th, the Giants leading 3-2. Base hits a right. Here comes the tying run, and here comes the three run. The Marlins win it 4-3. We're a good team. And whoever play against us, they have to play hard into the last out because you never know. And in game four, San Francisco did just that. Trailing by two in the ninth, the Giants rallied. And to win, the Marlins would have to take the defending NL champ's best shot. You've got J.T. Snow in scoring position. If he scores, we are dead even. Gets one to left field. Conine coming in. He can't get it. Here comes Snow. Here's the throw home. championship series 
The Marlins may have been heating up, but the Cubs appeared the team best armed for a World Series run, with aces Mark Pryor and Kerry Wood leading the way past Atlanta. It was a great one-two punch. Pryor with power, change of speeds, a smooth delivery, etc. The Cubs win on a two-hitter by Mark Pryor. Kerry Wood with a live fastball. I mean live. He blazed it right by him. That ball exploded. We believed that we could beat the Braves. And uh, at that time, we believed we could beat anybody. Cubs win. Bring on the Marlins. When they beat Atlanta, everybody in Chicago figured, we are finally going to the World Series. It had been 58 years since the Cubs had reached a fall classic, and there was a sense that the baseball gods were stirring. Meanwhile, in New York, one year seemed like an eternity for Yankee fans. And with their sights set on reclaiming the AL pennant, the Yanks rolled past the Twins. This is just the first step in the Yankees' drive toward the World Series. Meanwhile, against the A's, it appeared the Red Sox' long championship drought would continue as Oakland took the series opener in dramatic fashion and then made it two behind a dominant Barry Zito leaving the A's one win away from the ALCS and the Sox searching for answers. So we get back to Boston that night about 3.30 in the morning and we've flown for five hours and uh, I came in the clubhouse. I said, boys, I'm shaving my head. And I think 25 guys or 30 guys shaved their head. These kind of things work. And I said, you watch, we'll be in game five. Burns never touched the plate. He's out. Burns is out. He does not score. We had a couple plays in game three where we should have scored a bunch of runs. But Tejada, he collided with the third baseman. Bill Miller just stopped running, assuming that interference had been called. We got to the 11th inning, and Trot Nixon came up. Nixon high in the air, deep to center. Burns at the wall. Just getting a, a small piece of momentum, believing in yourself, and we all did. That carries on to the next game. Drive, hammer deep to right. Here comes Manny. He is safe at home. David Ortiz, go ahead double in game four, helped tie the series. And in game five, Manny Ramirez down the hero's cape. I think going into that game, Manny was like three for 24 off of Barry. Just didn't finish him off. You know, we had plenty of opportunity, but just couldn't get the job done. Strike three, call the Red Sox win it. The Boston Red Sox have come from behind, winning three in a row. Those are five outstanding games, and you know, this time of year, um, guys can take it to another level, and uh, we did. And they will beat the Yankees in the American League Championship Series. It's exciting when we play them in April. So I know it uh, in October, I know it'll be exciting too. Can you believe it? Bring on the Yankees! From the friendly confines of Wrigley Field in Chicago, the National League Championship Series about to get underway. The Chicago Cubs were the Cinderella team in baseball this season. Dusty comes in, turns them from lovable losers into winners. I was fresh coming off the World Series and in San Francisco the year before, so my confidence and belief was at the peak. Dusty Baker had other reasons to be confident as well, with a strong lineup at his command and a staff led by a pair of young stars on the mound. Gary Wood, first in strikeouts in the National League. Teammate Mark Pryor, second in strikeouts. But while the Cubs appeared armed and ready, the Cinderella Marlins also had an impressive young pitching staff and a group of players who were excited to try on the wild card glass slipper. This is a club that played with a great deal of heart. Uh, our players had tremendous desire and there was no fear whatsoever. Over in the American League, the Red Sox and Yankees had faced off 19 times in the regular season. Now, another chapter to their historic rivalry would be written in the ALCS. I don't think there's anything that has to be described about when the Yankees go to Boston or or when Boston comes to the stadium, uh, it was war. That's what makes this series awesome. You got two heavyweight fighters. This is almost like the World Series, really. 
Mike Messina got the call for round one of the heavyweight bout, and the Sox wasted little time in throwing the first punch. One on and there's a drive! Home run, David Ortiz! And the Red Sox take a 2-0 lead. Game one in Chicago, meanwhile, had begun as a slugfest, with the Cubs taking a 4-0 lead in the first. But the Marlins answered with a five spot of their own in the third. You couldn't give that team any breaks because they really took advantage. I mean, we scored two, they scored three. We scored four, they, they scored five. It was just like that. And they are stunned at Wrigley Field. In the Bronx, Boston's game one power surge continued with homers from Todd Walker and Manny Ramirez. And knuckleballer Tim Wakefield baffled the Yanks en route to a 5-2 Sox win. This one's over. The Boston Red Sox take a one-game lead in the American League Championship Series. While game one ended quietly in the Bronx, the Cubs and Marlins went to extra innings in their wild opener. And in the 11th, Mike Lowell hit the game's seventh homer. Swing and a fly ball center field. Lofted at the wall. Out of here! Mike Lowell comes off the bench. And he's a hero tonight in the 11th. He's given the Marlins a 9-8 lead. The Yanks and Cubs both even things in their respective game twos, setting up key battles in Boston and Florida. In game three in Miami, Doug Glanville's RBI triple in the 11th gave the Cubs an extra inning win. But that drama was overshadowed the next day at Fenway, where everyone was excited for a marquee pitching matchup. We got Roger and Martinez, game three, split, championship series, American League, all eyes are on the Sox. You've got to be going to the Sox. This is the Sox nation, 2003, and screw that curve. Fireworks were expected and delivered. This is the first postseason game in which there have been nine combined Cy Young Awards ever. And as the battle between Boston legends past and present began, things heated up in a hurry. And Karim Garcia delivered a base hit RBI first time up. That one's over his head. Garcia didn't like it. There was a lot of stuff going on at the ballpark that day. Balls coming in on guys. Pedro and what I thought was a clear attempt to hit a guy. I thought it was really retribution more than it was making a statement or competitive. Kareem gets the first base and the next, the next ball is a ground ball and he tries to kill Todd Walker. Second base, and the umpire's got to break up. Martinez now pointing. That's the wrong thing to do. As if this game needed any more emotion, the entire level of intensity has been raised another knot. That is high and tight, and now Manny walks out toward the mound. And he's shouting angrily at Roger. There's a fight on the side. Oh my gosh, Don Zimmer went after Pedro, and Pedro threw him down. Wow, is this ugly. Cooler heads eventually prevailed, and the Yanks got the win and the edge in the series. And this will definitely go down as an intense and memorable day in the long, serious rivalry between the Red Sox and the Yankees. The Game 3 brawl stole headlines all over the country. But back in Miami, the Cubs were only interested in taking a commanding lead in their series, which they did by beating Dontrell Willis and the Fish Eight to three. Cubs win. Cubs are one win away from the World Series. In Boston, meanwhile, Tim Wakefield's knuckler stymied New York again, evening the ALCS at two. And quite a night for Tim Wakefield. He gets a huge ovation as he walks off the mound from the Fenway faithful. In game five in Miami, the Cubs were looking to finish off the fish and reached their first World Series since 1945. But the Marlins wouldn't go easily as Josh Beckett tossed a two-hit shutout, keeping the Florida season alive at least a couple more nights. And it's on to Chicago for game six. You know, the guy pitches a great game against him, just tip your hat to him and say, hey, we're going home with Pryor uh, and Wood, and uh, we'll win it home in front of our fans. Cup fans have waited 58 years to get to the World Series. They will wait 48 more hours to have a chance again. How many times have you heard that phrase, wait till next year? Decades of frustration by Cubs and Red Sox fans had begun to give way to anticipation as their teams battled in the 2003 league championships. As next year finally arrived? The Cubs, Red Sox, World Series. Wow.
But the Yankees didn't share any sort of excitement. And in Game 5, New York regained control of the ALCS. The Red Sox, now faced with the daunting task of going to New York, down three games to two. All the money's got to be on the Yankees. Here are the 2003 Sox walking in here. Cowboy Sox! Or as loose as can be. This is the Sox! This is the Sox! Oh! Watching these Red Sox having a good time, you wouldn't know that they were down 3-2. to two. Swing and a fly ball. It's off the center field wall. And Omar heading for third. Bad throw. And Omar is going to score a triple and an error. It is gone into the upper deck. We believed in ourselves. We knew we were going to game seven. Ball game over. Boston wins. This is what it's about. It's a storybook. For baseball's other star-crossed franchise, Game 6 offered the chance to capture an NL pennant and advance to the World Series for the first time in nearly six decades. And starting Game 6 was a symbol of a new era in Cubs baseball. They have Mark Pryor getting the ball tonight. Swing and a miss by Gray! Mark Pryor has pitched brilliantly. Well, the Cubs fans can smell it now. Beginning to run out of outs. Mark Pryor was just dominating us. It was 3 nothing. Well, there was one out in the eighth inning. They had five outs to get to the World Series. Fly ball to left toward the line. Alou over. Does he have room? Alou cannot make the play. He's to the fact. 100%. I knew I had it. I had a great jump. I timed the ball real well. And I had it in my glove. The Cubs' tragic saga had included everything from a cat to a goat. And now a fan named Steve Bartman stepped into the spotlight. At the same time, we all said, let's make this guy famous. That's a base hit. Coming in to score is Pierre. They called the Bartman game, but we had an opportunity to get out of that situation, you know, with the double play. Round ball in the hole is short. And fumbled by Gonzalez and everybody's safe. It wasn't the Bartman non-play that did it. It was the four hits and the air after the Bartman ball. Can you believe it? The game is tied at three. There's no stopping the fish. It's an eight to three game. A nightmare of an eighth inning. All real Cub fans knew it was over. They knew it was over. Down two runs in game seven. Kerry Wood's home run gave Cubs fans a final glimmer of hope. Listen to these fans! We've got ourselves a brand new ball game. Cubs three, Marlins three. But on the mound, Wood couldn't deliver one more dominant performance. And soon the Cubs' clear shot at the fall classic was gone. When you have a three-run lead, and five outs to go to get you someplace you haven't been since 1945, you really need to get those five outs. The Cubs couldn't do it. The Florida Marlins are going to the World Series. The next night at Yankee Stadium, the rejuvenated Red Sox were primed and ready for the opportunity of a Game 7. We went into this game as confident as can be. Pedro Martinez coming here to the Bronx to try to get the Red Sox into the World Series against Florida. He's focused, he's in control, he has been remarkable so far tonight. With Martinez dominating the Yankees, David Ortiz appeared to punch the Sox ticket to the World Series in the eighth. It's 5-2. We're starting to feel good about ourselves. With the Red Sox, five defensive outs away from heading to the World Series. Pedro was rolling, but entered the eighth just at his normal 100 pitch count threshold. And that was the only opening the Yanks would need. Jeter with a double. Here's the 2 2. Base it. Jeter will come to the plate. It's a two run game. Grady Little out of the dugout. Grady comes out and asks Pedro basically, How you feeling? And, and he says, I want the ball. I got these guys. With 115 pitches on the night, Grady Little is going to stick with his starter. I'm right with Grady on that situation. Pedro Martinez is pitching. If anybody can get out of the jam, Pedro can do it. Even if his players had faith in their ace, Little's decision to leave Martinez in the game would become one of the most infamous in postseason history. 
This is the most blatant situation for a second guess in this series. This was not second guessing. Everyone said, what is he doing? Why is he leaving in there? Son of swings, a blue, base hit, run run scores, here's Matt Silly. Tie game. We, we managed to come back on him, and now here we are in the extra innings. Mariano Rivera's three scoreless innings kept the momentum in Yankee hands into the bottom of the 11th. I knew I was leading off the inning, just running off the field, and actually feeling like I was going to do something good. I just happened to say to him, I said, just get a single. Hey, just think back through the middle. Doesn't mean you won't you won't hit a home run. Doesn't mean you won't hit a home run. And I did. And the Yankees are going to the World Series! Aaron Boone has hit a home run! It was the greatest feeling I could ever have. All of a sudden, we're heading to another World Series. For the Boston Red Sox, more heartbreak. That game was especially tough. I think everybody on our team that night felt like there really is a curse. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Yankee Stadium, the site of the 2003 World Series. It's a beautiful night in the Bronx. Game one of the Fall Classic. It's the Fish and the Yanks. It was a tale of two very different clubs. The perennial powerhouse back in the series spotlight for the sixth time in eight years. And the scrappy underdogs aiming for respect and shooting for a second title as a wild card. Do you think anybody really gives us a chance? No. I think that really let us be free and, and play loose and, and together as a team. Are they going to be intimidated? My guess would be no. It was savvy intuition. And in game one, Florida used its trademark speed at the top of its lineup to grab the early lead. On a night when starter Brad Penny kept the Yankee bats at bay. There's the curveball, strike three call. After Penny's strong start, Ugeth Urbina came on to close it out. And the Florida Marlins have beat the New York Yankees in game one of the 2003 World Series. We just want to win four before they do. I don't care how we do it, but winning game one's big. I think we can put a lot of pressure on them for tomorrow, and, you know, hopefully we take game two. But in game two, the Yankees would turn to a reliable source of postseason success on the mound, Andy Pettit. Swing and a miss. He struck him out, and he strikes out the side. While at the plate, a newcomer provided power. Matt Sui sticks the bat out, hits it to dead center field. Three back to New York. Hideki Matsui's first inning blast made him the first Japanese player ever to homer in the Fall Classic. And the Yanks cruised to a 6-1 win, tying the series at one game apiece, as the teams headed south to sunny Florida. Go Marlins! Tonight, Josh Beckett on the mound for the Marlins, and Mike Messina will pitch for the Yankees. The right-handers yielded just one run apiece through seven innings, but in the eighth, the Yanks rallied off Dontrell Willis. That one is going to be a base hit. And so he's done it again. And then the best closer in the game shut the door for his fifth save of the postseason. The ball game is over, and the New York Yankees now lead this World Series two games to one. The Marlins took the lead early in game four, but in the ninth, the Yankees rallied against Urbina. The time runs are on for New York. The Marlins need one more strike to wrap it up. Here's the strike. Sierra's got a base hit in a right field. Here to score is Williams. Here comes DeLucci, and he'll score easily. The Yankees have tied the game. A triple by Ruben Sierra. The game stayed tied into the 12th, when Alex Gonzalez made just his second hit of this series a big one. Down the left field line, maybe. Into the corner. Goal! A home run! The Marlins win! And this World Series is all even again. Two games of peace. And the next night, Florida snagged another early lead, and this time held it to grab a 3-2 series lead. This series now shifts back to New York for game six. Well, we're back where we started, right here at Yankee Stadium. The Marlins roll in after winning two of three at home. They're up three games to two. Six seasons earlier, the Marlins had won their first world title, 
And now, with Florida one win away from again surprising the baseball world, the club turned to Josh Beckett on three days rest, a decision that appeared like the right one from the outset. Breaking ball has it frozen, knees buckling. Home plate still 60 feet, six inches away. I just had to go out and execute pitches, and that was, that was it. Beckett kept the Yankee bats silent all night, and after Florida scratched out two runs off Andy Pettit, the big righty came out for the ninth, looking to finish what he started. Jorge Posada, the last hope for the Yankees here in the ninth inning. Slow chopper, Beckett may make the final play, pegs him at the Marlins win! Florida Marlins, the vicious warm up stream are the world champions! David had slain Goliath. Or at least, that's how everyone else in the baseball establishment saw it. In our minds, we were a legit contender. We were the hottest team in baseball going in there, and we proved it. Over the next four years, four more wildcard teams would advance to the World Series. Astros are going to the 05 World Series. World Series bound. This one is a Rockies winner. Only one of them would win it all. The Boston Red Sox have won the pass. The Boston Red Sox, who in 2004 would make an improbable journey to World Series glory. The Boston Red Sox earned this celebration with the biggest comeback in postseason baseball history. A journey that in many ways began the night they fell to the Yankees. The Yankees go to the World Series for the 39th time in their remarkable history. A series that was the highlight of an incredible, memorable 2003. A wild ride in what was an unforgettable baseball season.